his file. Oh no. This hasn't happened in decades. The last time this happened, the infected person had to be terminated. <gasps> Let's take a look at his case file. Name, Roberto Xavier. Age, 67. Height, 1.75 meters. Weight, undisclosed. Symptoms In denial of the real state of business and is not open to criticism or bad news Has too many cronies who won't be critical of his performance And lacks authenticity when leading others Diagnosed with CEO disease Roberto Don't worry We gotta save you Roberto You've got the CEO disease the only antidote is to regenerate self-awareness. You've got to be conscious of your strengths while acknowledging what you still have yet to learn. Now, if you keep this up, it could prove to be detrimental to not only you, but the company too. You don't want to end up like the last victim of the CEO disease, right? <gasps> the Johari window comprises of the open self, what others know about you and which you know too. The blind self, what others can see about you, but you can't see. The hidden self, what others don't know about you, but you do. And finally, the unknown self, what others don't know about you, and neither do you. The best way to shrink your blind self is to get constant feedback. We all have blind spots, and if we can learn what they are, we become better leaders. Roberto, if you won't listen to us, you shall be quarantined. Or worse, terminated. Jane, Jane, Jane. No, I don't need no self-awareness. I think you all delusional. Mm. Roberto, you leave me no choice. The antidote, please. Okay, 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 okay. Self-awareness, here I come. Welcome everyone, welcome to another beautiful Thursday and joining us today on the Leadomic Show is a very special guest that we have all the way from Melbourne, Australia. Michelle Gibbings is joining us. Michelle, welcome to the show and really, really super glad to have you join us uh, all the way from the, uh, so I hear, the ultimate lockdown city in the world, Melbourne, Australia. Right? <laughs> so, well, thank, I was going to say thank you so much for having me and we get released tomorrow. So it's a, it's a good day. <laughs> there you go. You get released from your prison, of <laughs> your home prison. Also. Um, so, so Michelle's an author, a workplace expert, uh, and, and, and you've got a very, very interesting book, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but Michelle, maybe just as we start, maybe you can quickly tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to this space of being a workplace expert and how you got to where you got to, literally. Right? So maybe you can share a little bit about yourself. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, look, if I think about my my background, I, I, I'd classify it in sort of two key pieces because I love learning and I love being challenged. And all through my career, I've had, you know, different industries that I've worked in and different professions. So I originally started in politics. I worked as a speech writer, a media advisor. Then I went to work in the mining sector. Um, then I went to work in financial services. And in those industries, I did different roles. And so I was, you know, head of compliance. I ran strategy functions. I ran large scale change programs. And then I got to that certain point in my career where you look up and you go, you know, I've got to the level that I wanted to get to in the corporate world. Now for me, it's about 
I, I want autonomy. I want the the ability to be able to influence my own outcomes in my own sort of way. But I still want to learn. I still want to challenge, be challenged. And I want to be able to share that knowledge and those insights with people. And that's what led me to do what I'm doing now. So I've been running my business for the last seven years. And, you know, I often think, you know, it's been hard work, as you would know, it's hard work to start a business. But it's so rewarding when you can see the difference that you're making through the work that you do. And that's really what led me to the workplace space, because, you know, throughout my 25 plus years in corporate, I had, you know, the pleasure of working with some amazing leaders. I also had, you know, as most people do, work with some leaders who weren't optimal. Um, They weren't bad people. They just weren't good bosses. And that had an impact, you know, on me personally. It also had an impact on the people that I was working with. And so when I sat down and sort of really thought about the space that I wanted to work in, it was really about how do you create an environment where everyone can come to work, be their best. Everyone can thrive, connect in a way that is, you know, happy and healthy and engaging. And that's what I get to do. You know, I work with people across all different industries at all different levels, and it's very much helping them understand themselves, helping understand the environment they're in and what they need to do to be able to bring their best selves to work every day. Fantastic. And, and you know, uh, for those of you just joining in, we have a fantastic guest, a workplace expert. Um, and uh, we've got Swax who says, great topic. We've got uh, Pertal who says, hi, welcome. Uh, and uh, very glad to have each and every one of you. And if you have any questions for Michelle, just shoot them in the comment section and we'll try and get to them uh, as we have this continued discussion. Um, so with that, Michelle, you know, I was, you know, when, when you talk about workplace, um, there's a lot of complications, right? I mean, part of it is, um, there's a dynamics of the leadership. There's also a culture which sometimes may not necessarily be um, organizational. It may be inherited from the national culture, uh, especially in many developing countries. You get very strong authoritative uh, regimes in power and so on. You kind of inherit that uh, culture into your organization. And there's many different permeations of, of, of what culture can be in an organization. So how, I mean, what would the starting point be if you were to want to seriously, I mean, as a, as a leader, you say, I want to take this seriously. I want to do something about the workplace. I want to make it, as you said, empowering, engaging, um, enlightening, and, and 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 really uplifting, right? Um, how how does one go about uh, starting the process of looking at culture? I think the first thing is to accept that you can make a difference. And so, you know, when you think about an organisational culture, as a leader, you might not be able to influence all of that organisational culture, but you can absolutely influence in your domain, within your team. And I've seen organisations where the, you know, dynamic of the master culture that runs across the whole organisation is not very nice, but pockets and teams have got really happy, thriving cultures because the leader is dedicated to making sure that they've got a good culture. So the firstly, accept your role, get committed to wanting to make a difference. And the start then is to go, okay, I'm I'm gonna take, I'm gonna play a part in this. I need to, with my team, identify what's the current culture that we've got, because there might be elements that you want to take with you, but then there might be some elements that you want to leave behind. And you need to do that collectively. You can't as a leader kind of sit in a corner and then design your culture and then say to the team, oh, look, here, I've created it for you. It needs to be created in a way that is connected and engaged and collaborative. And so once you've worked through where you are currently, you then go, well, as a team, what's our aspirational culture? What is it that we want to work towards? Because once we understand what that you know, end state, for want of a better word, looks like, then we can work through what are the behavioural things that we might want to do. There might be systems or processes we need to put in place. There might be particular symbols or events that we want to create to really help establish that culture. And the other thing that's really critical with all of that is to remember changing culture takes time. So this isn't something that you, you know, do over a couple of weeks. It is many months and sometimes many years to get the type of culture that you want. Right, right. And and I, I guess your, your starting point is precipitated on the fact that you need a, a leader that wants to make that change, right? Uh, that good leader, so to say. And, and you know, I, I noticed your, your latest book is uh, the opposite, a bad boss. <laughs> what to do if you work for one, manage one, or are one? <laughs> and and uh, you know, it's 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 interesting. I mean, 
uh, you know, if you have a good one, you know, po potentially they are thinking about how they, they can drive that change. Um, so what if you do, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about that book, because I think that's interesting because a lot of people say my boss is a bad boss, right? Uh, I work for one. Not, not many will say I am the bad boss, uh, but, but maybe you can help us to, uh, to diagnose ourselves that we may have that, that so-called CEO disease that we just saw in a little clip earlier on. Uh, but, you know, talk us through your book. What does it mean to be a bad boss? Um, and what does it mean to undo it and become a good one? And likewise, if you do work for one, are that what are things that we can do um, to address that or to mitigate at least some of the the pain that uh, or, or maybe maybe it's good. Uh, I, again, I, I I know you learn quite a bit from bad bosses as much as you do from good bosses. But but talk us through that. Well, what 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 does your book uh, 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 you know share some insights from your book? I think there's a couple of points to start with, and one is to recognise that. You know, a bad boss may not be a bad person. And often there's different types of bad bosses. And I talk about this right at the beginning because, you know, I stick my hand up right up front and say at a certain point in my career, I was a bad boss. And, you know, I wasn't a bad person. I wasn't mean. I wasn't nasty. I didn't yell at people, didn't throw objects at them or anything like that. But I was ineffective. And that was because I didn't understand what it meant to be a leader. I was very focused on management tasks didn't understand the role that I needed to play to really connect and engage with my team. And so I was very fortunate because early in my leadership career, I had a boss who pulled me aside and said, you know, Michelle, I get the work's important and I get that you're ambitious and you want to do a good job. But really for you as a leader, you need to focus on your team and you need to be there more for them. You need to understand where they're coming from. She really helped shift how I see what it meant to be a leader. And so she had a fundamental role in helping to shape me as, as a leader. And so one of the sort of the premise behind the book is everybody needs to own their part. So if you're working with someone who is a bad boss, you know, firstly check, are you a bad employee? Are you not delivering what you need to be delivering? And that's why you're having a challenging relationship with your boss. If that's not the situation, then there are different strategies you can put in place to really understand what's going on for your boss. Because sometimes, you know, people are in situations that are challenging and they're not equipped to really deal with it. And so if you're the employee, sometimes the best thing that you can do to get a better work environment is to sit down and talk to your to boss and say, look, I can see there's a lot of pressure and stress. You know, how can I help you? So rather than taking that step back and waiting for the boss to change. Once again, though, if you're the boss, and I, and I loved your video clip right at the beginning because it's so true. If you don't have self-awareness, it is so hard to ever be a good leader. And the best way to get self-awareness is to do a 360 degree feedback where it's anonymous, but you get that really objective, constructive feedback. Because once you can see the difference between how you see yourself and how people experience you as a leader, you're then able to actually do something with it. And then the last part of it is if you are the leader of leader. So if you are managing someone who is a, not a good a good leader, you have an accountability and what's the role that you're playing to really coach and guide, mentor. And then if that's, you know, if you all that work that you're putting isn't bearing fruit, well, then what are you going to be doing? What's the standard that you're setting to go, well, actually, output's important, but if you don't lead and engage in a way that is aligned with the organisational values, then there's not a place for you here. So it really is every part of the, you know, the organisational dynamic and it, you know, the, the boss, the employee and the boss's boss all playing a role to make sure that you get the best possible outcome. Fantastic. And, you know, I, I, I guess, um, you know, you talked, I mean, maybe I start with the boss's perspective, you know, I mean, um, and, and, you know, you, you do this quite a bit with, with the different teams that you coach and, and you help uh, and the leadership um, sessions that you kind of pull together. Um, how often, um, you know, are bosses really uh, aware of their, their behavior and some of the toxicity that they create in the environment? Um, or is this something that's very common in the sense that we we kind of get so worked on the tasks and the matters at hand that we forget? I mean, similar to your story you were talking about yourself. Um, is this very common? Is, is this something that uh, we need to uh, uh, have a process in place to check ourselves uh, at, you know, every couple of months or weeks? I know Andrew Jong, the, the former uh, CEO for Air One, she used to say every three years I'd fire myself. Uh, and rehire myself and then forget about the past and 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 it's a way of of kind of reflecting and uh, and and being self aware uh but but what what would you recommend i mean is this common and uh, secondly you know how would we mitigate or overcome some of these things 
I, I think the, the self-reflection piece is really important. The challenge with self-reflection is if you are delusional, you are going to self-reflect in a delusional way and you're going to go, oh, I'm awesome. So that's where you really do need that objective feedback. Uh, sadly, if you look at the stats, the statistics will show that there are lots of bosses out there who aren't as effective as they could be. You know, Gallup, which is the American organization, you know, their research shows that about 82% of people find their leaders uninspiring. Um, there was reports that came out of the US, and looking at this is a couple of years old, but basically the, you know, the sort of the summary was 65% of people surveyed said they would rather get a new boss than get a pay rise. Um, so you certainly see in the data that there is room for improvement, um, but you also do have some fantastic bosses. I think the great thing about leadership is leadership is a learned skill. And so it's not as though that you're born with it and you've either got it or you don't. If you've got the desire to be a better leader, you can be a better leader. And that's what, you know, that's you know, part of the genesis of the book was really helping people to take them through different exercises and learnings that they could do to really design, well, who am I? What do I stand for? What's the legacy I want to leave behind as a leader? And therefore, what does that then mean in terms of how I show up every day and how I interact with my team? Because once you accept that leadership is a learned skill, you then take sole accountability for shifting what's not working rather than going, well, this is just who I am. And so, you know, if you don't like it, you you know, you can either leave. And I, because I think that sort of attitude, what we're finding, and certainly through the pandemic, we've seen some amazing leaders really sort of step up, but we're also seeing employees sit back and really reassess what's the role that my career is playing with my life. Because the two you want the two to come together and be connected rather than being sort of divorced from each other. And employees, particularly in you know certain markets, and I said, you know, in Australia at the moment, it is certainly a seller's market, meaning that employees um, have, you know, we're high demand. And when you're in a high demand market for talent, if you don't have good leaders, you are not going to get the talent that you need to run and grow your organization. Interesting, um, and you know, if, if if you know, if you happen to work for a boss um, that is that is delusional, <laughs> or that is uh, you know creating these toxic uh, environments, um, what should you be doing? Should you be uh, confronting them? Should you be uh, approaching them? Um, or I mean, because this, this is a tough one, right? Because you know, you you like you said, I've ticked all the boxes and I figured out that I'm not. Uh, you know, it's not that I'm doing a bad job. It's not that I'm doing this. I, you know, I've, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's not. And now you say, I want to address this because it's an organizational issue. How does one as an employee, do, uh, you know, uh, uh, work on that? Yeah. Firstly, I think you need to understand what type of bad boss they are because, and that comes into what's their level of self-awareness. So the level of self-awareness around the impact that they're having on you. And then they're actually, they're, they're the desire to change. And if I go back through my, um, career you know I worked for someone at a point in time and they were a bad boss because they were ineffective in how they were leading but they're a lovely person you know love, you know great to have a chat to really nice person but just off the Richter scale disorganized and their disorganization affected how I worked but also affected my reputation because I'd get all these pieces of work late and then I'd have to rush around and try and get it done and then people would think oh well Michelle's disorganized and, you know, I had a situation where they went on holidays. And when they went on holidays, I, you know, this is back in the days before we had inboxes that were electronic. So I'm showing my age there, um, Roshan. Um, but, you know, I managed his inbox. I found all these, you know, reports coming through that I needed to work on. And I was like, oh, wow, you don't get 24 hours notice. You actually get four weeks notice that that's due. And so when he came back from holidays, I said to him, um, do you mind if I just keep managing the, you know, the items that come into your inbox? And he just sort of looked at me and he goes, well, that's not your job. You're not my EA. I said, no, 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 yeah, that's okay. I'm happy to do it for you. And now people would say to me, Michelle, that wasn't your role. And it wasn't. But what it did was it shifted how we worked. I managed the workflow coming into the office. I was then able to better manage how I did my work, shifted the stress levels in terms of our relationship. And, you know, he kept being the type of boss he was going to be because he was not going to change. So what I did was changed how I worked with him. That then meant I got what I needed from the relationship. 
Now that's very different to someone else I worked with through my corporate career who was, you know, probably borderline narcissistic and a very hard person to work with. But if I look back through, you know, where I am now, I wouldn't be where I am now if I hadn't worked for him. And so one of the things I often say to people is if you can't change the work environment and the workflow to be able to better suit how you need to work, and if you can't sit down and have that upfront conversation about how you work together, then one of the things you do need to consider is what am I getting out of this role? Because sometimes you can stay in those really tough roles for a short period of time because it's going to be that stepping stone, that elevation that you need to be able to get to what it is that is that next big role for you. But as you're doing that, you need to be really clear that staying in that role isn't going to impact your mental health and well-being. Because when you're working for people like that, it's hard. You know, I was fortunate that I had, you know, support at home, but I would have many times when I would be going into the office and it would be really, really stressful. So self-care matters. And if you are in an environment where the damage that you can see to your mental health, your well-being and your sense of self and self-esteem is being eroded, then you really do need to go, look, you know, now might be the time that I really do need to leave. So you work that through as a process. As part of that process also, you know, who do you have around you that can help support you as you're going through that, that, that difficult time? And then the last piece is there are some bosses that you can sit down and talk to because they just don't know that they're having an impact on you. And when they find out, they're devastated might be too strong a word, but for some of them, they really are because they genuinely want to be good leaders. And so if you sit down and you talk through and go, look, I really want to come to work and do a good job. And I really want to support you, but I'm struggling at the moment because of X, Y, and Z. Are you open to us having a conversation about how we could work together more effectively? And so you invite them to the conversation. And if they turn around and go, no, I think I'm doing an awesome job. Well, then you know exactly where you stand with them. So invite them yep, to the conversation. Yep. And that way they, they then have a choice as to about what they do and what they don't do. That's that's uh, well, well, well said. In fact, um, you know, uh, some, someone just, uh, Wags just made a comment that, uh, you, you know, love how neat and tidy your background is, Michelle. You're sending us some good vibes to all of us. Uh, so, so there you go. <laughs> um, you know, but but as a follow through from that, um, you know, as a uh, question from Sashi, hey, Michelle, uh, love the insights. How can a bad boss see the need for change if he has been successful being a bad boss? And I, I maybe I'll rephrase this a little bit because I think it applies also um, you know, uh, uh, Marshall Goldsmith once said, you know, what, what got you here may not necessarily get you there, but because of your certain behavior of being, you know, uh, a certain uh, or a tyrant <laughs> and somehow you successfully managed to get work shipped um, and now, you know, you replicate that behavior as you go up the organization. Um, at some point in time, as you become leaders of leaders, you know, that sort of behavior doesn't work. Um, so how does one uh, change when they can't see it because they, they've had success uh, with that behavior for a long, long time? Well, hopefully they've got a leader, the leader that they report to around them, that shows them that there's a better way and also demonstrates to them that you will cap out. You will get to a point where, um, and I think, you know, you're seeing this in lots of quarters around the world where people have had certain behaviours. They've done things which are highly questionable, highly unethical, um, and they've, you know, got away with it, but not forever. Um, you know, I used to work with someone who would always talk about corporate karma. Um, and, you know, you might get away with it for a certain period of time, but it's not sustainable. Eventually, your behaviour catches up with you. And so it's about you going, you know, well, what's, you know, who am I? What do I stand for? What's the legacy I want? What's the impact that I want? And also, do I want a sustainable career? Because if you want a sustainable career, more and more organisations, they can't tolerate bad behaviour. Because if they accept that bad behaviour, in many jurisdictions, they're actually liable from an oh and perspective in terms of the impact on that person's mental health and wellbeing, in terms of that, that, that leader's team. And so if I was a senior leader and there were people in the organisation whose behaviour was not aligned with the values, I would be going, this isn't just about the outcomes and the culture. We also are folk, you know, exposing our organisation to legal liability and other risks that we just don't need to face. 
fantastic. And, you know, are we, we're going to take a quick short break and we're going to come back, uh, Michelle, with the Thinkonomics challenge and that's going to be fun because we'll, we'll get to grill you in a very short uh, uh, burst. Uh, but before that, we're going to take a quick short break. We've got uh, a part of our partners, Happily, um, and, and you talk about work, workplace transformation, workplace culture, uh, what better app than Happily, which enables you to have engagement um, and, and data on and employee intelligence on your employees. So let's have a quick break. Uh, we'll be back in about 30, 40 seconds. Uh, Here's happily for each and every one of you. Welcome back to the Lean Orbit Show with Michelle Gibbings. Michelle, really happy to have you with us. And we're talking about workplace culture. We're talking about bad bosses. And I love that book, uh, Bad Boss. And for those of you who have not uh, picked up your copy, uh, please go to michellegibbings.com and you should be able to get this exciting book all in red too, uh, you know, very, very nicely. Uh, uh, and, and you're so dressed, dressed uh, just like the book. Well, well done, Michelle. <laughs> I actually didn't plan that. <laughs> So, so you've got uh, you've got bad boss, uh, but Michelle. But but as always, to every one of our guests, we take all our guests through the Thinkonomics challenge. Now, what's the Thinkonomics challenge? Let's check this out. All right. So here's the Thinkonomics challenge. It's uh, your five questions to answer. Each question is based on a leaderomics value, empowering relationship growth giving or building the future. Those are five values that we have. And you have to answer as many questions as you can in 60 seconds. We'll give a little bit of ex 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 exceptions uh, for Australians. We understand you may need a little bit more time. So <laughs> we'll do a minute and a half. Uh, I think our producer, uh, uh, but 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 we will, so it's about 20, 20 seconds to 30 seconds at the most per question. Um, yeah. and, uh, and we're ready to go. So we go in three, to one, uh, let's get the first question on. How do you measure the success or failure of a relationship? 30 seconds, Michelle. I base it on trust, to what extent we trust each other and what we're saying to each other. Fantastic, all right. So trust is the measure of a relationship. Would you cover up or testify against someone if you were paid a million dollars? I wouldn't cover up because I need to stand to my integrity and to my values. All right, so that's a no. All right, um, let's see. And this time is good. What is the greatest invention ever in history? Uh, well, is according to historians, it's the wheel. It is? <laughs> All right, not fire. The, the one who found fire. Okay, the greatest invention is the wheel. All right, question number four. How can you build communities of love? Start with yourself. You have to love yourself before you're able to love others. Fantastic. All right. Start with yourself, just like a leader. Uh, they need to start with yourself, so it's being self-aware. All right. And the final question, and I think you'll make it, right? It's going to be less than a minute. Wow, well done. What qualities in you do you wish to share and teach others to harness? Why is that? Love of learning. I absolutely love learning. I think there's not a day goes by that I don't learn something new. And I think if you can fall in love with learning, you're not fearful of change and change is all around us. Fantastic. And there you have it. And uh, so Michelle gets a copy of our leader, Leadership Nuggets. And, and uh, that we sent to you, Michelle. Congratulations. And uh, well done. Uh, well done on, uh, on, on getting the Leadership Nuggets. And um, congratulations. You've, you've done it. Uh, just like the Queen of Sweden, Robert Kiyosaki, and many others, you've uh, completed the Thinkonomics Challenge. Um, Excellent. 
Fantastic. And, you know, I, I want to go back to a little bit to this whole uh, uh, workplace um, uh, and culture and, and trying to build, um, you know, a, not a non-toxic workplace, you know, a workplace that that, uh, that is inspiring, uh, that is authentic, that, that brings the best out of us and, you know, that, that people get excited to be part of. Um, you know, especially now as you look at um, the changing workplace, right, the dynamics of the workplace or what we call the hybrid workplace where some are at home, some are... Uh, you know, uh, at an office, some may be no, you know, in Bali, uh, probably in an island somewhere working. But I mean, you've got folks all over the world and you've got the digital nomads and the gig economy and, and so many different forces that are that are sort of uh, impending on the structure of an organization, right? How it's structured, how uh, work is conducted, how employees engage and how employees come together and how culture is built. Um, how does one um, as we grapple with all these different changes and permeations that are happening, how does one actually create a culture that is sustainable that and that enlists all the things that you talk about? You know, the empowerment, the engagement, the, the excitement, the, the inspiration, um, and and enables you to ship out these high quality products and, and services uh, in the workplace. What 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 is your take on that? I think the most important thing to, to recognize is culture is not static. So we don't create a culture, put it in cement, and then just watch it solidify culture is dynamic and you know the best sort of work from a sort of a, an academic perspective is obviously the work of Edgar Schein and he always talks about that that sense that culture is that lived experience it's the way that we do things around here and so the reason culture keeps changing is every time a new person comes into the organization they have an ability to impact that culture and so that's one of the things when I'm, when I'm always working with teams I say it's really important you know, often teams will do work where they work through the vision and the values of the team and then they set it in concrete, you know, because they'll put it onto a poster and they'll stick it up somewhere. And then new people come into the team and they look at that vision and they look at those values and they can't connect with it because they weren't there when it was created. And no one takes them through a process of really helping them understand what it means to live that and be a part of it, but also give them the opportunity to shape it in a way that has meaning for them. And so the really important part with all of this is you do need to be clear, what's our purpose, what's our vision and what's our values? That is created in a way that is joint, that's connected, but also every team needs to be able to make their own sense of that in terms of what it means for them in terms of how they work and come together. And that needs to be reinforced all the time. And so for leaders, culture never stops. You don't get to the end of a, you know, an end of a year and tick all the boxes and go, great, we're done. You know, next year, yeah, let's go to Bali, let's take holidays, let's not worry about it. Because you have to keep putting effort into it. And I think that's the thing for um, for some people who see, you know, leadership and culture as perhaps a bit transactional. They go, oh, but didn't we do all this last year? And it's like, well, sorry, you need to keep doing it. And so you want to live it. You want to embed it in the DNA of how you turn up every day. Nice. And and are there are there specific tools or um, processes that you know one should be thinking about as you as you look at the as you chart culture or as you design culture as you intentionally develop this culture? Look, there's different ways. I mean, people often talk about cultural archetypes. So a cultural archetype is almost like the personality of the organisation. So what's your organisation's personality and what do you want it to be? Um, Caroline Taylor, who wrote the book Walking the Talk, talks about six different types of cultural archetypes. And that can be a good place to start because it gives you a frame that you can work with. But often when I'm working with people and looking at organisational culture, it's very similar to what you would do from a strategic planning perspective. Where are you now? Where do you want to get to? And therefore, what are the strategies and tactics that you need to put in place to be able to get there? And it's important to reference your culture and your strategy, because really what your culture is doing is going, what are the people elements and how we connect, engage and work together that is actually supporting us to deliver on our strategy? And so it's important to work those two together, because sometimes people work them in isolation. And the problem is when you work them in isolation, you can be creating an organisational strategy that your culture isn't fit for purpose in terms of being able to deliver at that point in time. So do the two together. Yep, and make sure that that alignment happens, right? Um, you know, we've got a whole bunch of people who are saying hi to you. Um, uh, Nantini hi. says hi, and uh, Edison uh, is giving you a, a nice smiley face. <laughs> and uh, I think, uh, Michelle, I, I think people are very appreciative of uh, 
of your insights. Uh, so uh, uh, another another thanks for the insight. So you know, if you have any questions, uh, comments, or uh, uh, anything to ask, Michelle, shoot them in the questions, and I think we will squeeze a little bit of time to take some of that uh, in in a bit. Um, I wanna I wanna zoom in on a little bit on leadership. Um, you know, I, I think. Um, and maybe we can start with yourself. You know, a lot of times uh, Warren Binney talks about crucible leadership where, you know, when bad things happen to you, not necessarily is bad. It actually helps you to develop a vision for yourself. It helps you to 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 to, to focus yourself on either that injustice or, or solving that problem or or, 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 or uh, you know, ensuring that grief is resol uh, resolved, right? Um, you know, what, what about yourself? I mean, in your own life, um, as you went towards this part uh you know this somewhat successful part of, of 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 becoming an author and becoming a workplace champion and guru um what sort of crucible moments in your life help shape you uh and enable you to become the person that you are today uh i often think you map us so much back to childhood you know we are all the product of the environment that we grew up in um and you know for me i grew up in a very smart family you know my mum was a teacher my dad was an academic um and you know I had to really work hard you know I sort of you know sometimes it sound, can sound a bit jokey but it's it wasn't at the time I was you know the youngest of four very bright siblings and every single teacher oh we had your sister last year oh she's bright oh are you as smart as she is and I wasn't um, academically, no matter how hard I tried, I could never do as well as them. Um, and it's interesting because I look back and go, it could have sent me one or two ways, totally off the rails, like just hate school. Whereas for me, what it did was it imbued in me this incredible work ethic. And this would be a little mantra in my head, which was, you know, I'm not the smartest person in the room, but by God, I'll be the hardest working. Um, and so it's interesting, though, because you can hold on to that sometimes and in a way that's not helpful. And that's certainly one of the things that I had to learn as I started getting into leadership roles of what are the elements that I've taken from my childhood that have defined me that actually aren't helping me. Um, and so as I went through my corporate journey, I was very much, you know, I remember I had once a, a boss who said to me, oh, my, you know, Michelle, you're like a sponge. Every time there is something that you can learn, you are latching onto it and learning as much as you possibly can. And so as I'm learning, I was learning more about myself, learning more about what it is that I wanted to do, open to experience. And, you know, I used to have this saying in the back of my head, which was very much, I want to live my life as an adventure. And that's not, you know, jumping out of airplanes, although I have done that once. Um, but it is that sense that I want to be able to push myself and feel that I've done what I could do to the best of my ability. And underneath that, often there is a bucket load of fear. And certainly when I went out and left corporate, I had a lot of people who were stunned because, you know, I was at executive level in corporate. I had people who said to me, what are you doing? And I was very fortunate that I had an incredibly supportive husband who was like, oh, Michelle, go for it. Just do it. Um, you know, and, but I really didn't know where I was going to be focused. I just knew that I wanted to do something different, that my time in corporate had come to an end and it was now time for me to work for myself, but I didn't really know in what guise. And so as I was going through, I guess, the process of working that through, it came to me that really I needed to focus on the, the people side of things because that's the bit that I had learned the most about myself um, and also I felt was where I could really make the biggest difference. Fantastic. And, and uh, Zulkanin, uh, Zulkanin, welcome to the show. And uh, he says, good one, Michelle. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, and I think I think that's, uh, you know, my, my favorite quote is actually from Helen Keller, who says, life is either a daring adventure or nothing. Um, and, and you want to make your life that daring adventure. So, so um, you know, kudos to you for, for going out there and making that happen. Because I think a lot of people can get stuck and say, you know, it's comfortable. Uh, you know, why, why change it, uh, even though it may not necessarily be that life that you want. Uh, to live and and you know when, when you did that transition um, of of moving out from corporate into the world, I, I'm sure it must have been hard, and I'm sure you must have been thinking about it like countless times. Um, what what sort of ultimately enable you to make that transition? I mean, I, I think there are many people who are stuck in jobs that they may not be satisfied in, or they're stuck in uh, places that they may not necessarily want to be in, but they just counting the the loss right i mean they're looking at it from a perspective of not the positive but the negative the losses that may incur um so how does one untangle themselves from focusing on the loss and really focusing on the benefits uh which you did uh, quite quite well i think i think the important part is you need space so i actually worked this through when i was on a meditation retreat um and i know that might sound a little bit woo woo but i if 
I don't think if I hadn't had that quiet time, that alone time, I would have just done what I had always done, um, which was do the corporate thing because that's what I was good at and that's what I knew. And I had come out of a really, really tough corporate role um, and it was not an environment where I could be my best. And, you know, I could see it sort of slowly chipping away at my soul. And on this meditation retreat, I had sort of, you know, been working through my career drivers and I realised I loved loved learning always and always will. I loved being challenged. But in the past, I had needed security. And by that, I meant primarily financial security. I didn't need that anymore. What I needed was autonomy. And the only way I could get autonomy was to go and work for myself. And I still remember the conversation with Craig. And I came home and I said to Craig, I'm done. And Craig goes, done with what? I said, done with corporate. And he goes, excellent. What are you going to do? I said, I'm going to open a business. And he goes, in what? I said, I've got no idea. Um, that was seven years ago. And so there was a, this massive leap of faith. Um, yes, it did mean we had to curtail expenses. There was a whole lot, a lot of stuff that we did. But I've always been very conservative with money. Um, and I often say to people, you know, when you're thinking about your career, you need to think about your finances and career hand in hand. And yes, I know that I've, you know, I've been very lucky and very fortunate in you know, the jobs that I've had because they've been well paying jobs. And so not that's harder for some, for some people. But often I see people spend beyond their means. And when they spend beyond their means, they are then captured by their environment because they have no choice but to keep working in an environment that is paying at a certain level, even though they hate it. And so I often say, really look at your finances because that is where you will get the freedom to sometimes make a choice. Now, it certainly meant, you know, the first couple of years of running a business, I made nowhere near what I made when I was, you know, working in corporate, but I was happier, I was healthier. Um, and I look at where I am now and go, best decision I ever made. That said, I couldn't do what I'm doing now if I hadn't had the 25 years in corporate because what I bring with the work that I do, and, you know, yes, I've got academic connections and qualifications and all that kind of stuff, but I've also got the reality of I know what it's like to work in corporate environments, in big organisations. I understand the complexity. And I think that's important because in all of this work, you need to ground it in a reality. Organisations change. Organisations can be really hard. Um, you know, I, I don't come from a philosophy that I think anyone wakes up in the morning with the goal of going, I'm going to be a crap boss today and I'm going to be a really bad employee. I, 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 I fundamentally think when people turn up and they're not at their best, it's because something in the environment's not working for them. And what we need to be able to do is then help them navigate through that so that they can be their best. Absolutely, absolutely, and um, and and I, I think uh, Husni also agrees on the good points there. Uh, Michelle, thank you so much for for them. You know, one of the things uh, interestingly is, um, you know, we have a framework called the science of building leaders, and I'll just share that a bit. And a lot of things that Michelle talked about was was the early childhood. You know, your character, your values, and, and for her, it's hard work. Um, you know, that security of your parents or that that enables you to influence uh, uh, self awareness and as intelligence capability, and and ultimately vision and crucible moments or critical events help shape who you are you know as, as we wrap this show um and and, and you can read more uh, on 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 the signs of building leaders um and we'll, we'll get we'll get our producers to put some links out there but you know michelle just as we wrap up this show you know you look at leadership as a journey you know as you said uh you know uh, quite well that you know it's it's you learn as you grow um and you become better and you actually enable pieces of dots that somehow don't seem aligned to somehow come together and then you start to see things that you don't see um, and that enables you uh, you to progress as a leader um, if you were to impart some nuggets of wisdom or some you know gems uh, that you can leave as advice um, for some of those who are wanting to become this uh, this great leader this inspiring empowering and, and positive leader um, that that enables organizations to grow or scale um, what sort of advice would you impart you know as we wrap this show up uh, um, to, to 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 these aspiring leaders and and what would you want them to focus on uh, as leaders I'm going to borrow the quote that Maya Angelou always talked about, which is people won't remember what you do, but they're going to remember how you made them feel. And really as a leader, that's the most important thing is to really focus on how you make them feel because, you know, we are emotional creatures. You know, if you, you can shift someone's emotions by what you do, that then impacts how they feel and how they think and how they act. And so if you can connect with someone and really make them feel valued and make them feel heard they will do the work and the work will get done well 
Whereas if all you're ever doing is focusing on the work and not focusing on who they are as a human, then the work doesn't get done in the same way or to the same level. Fantastic. And one, one, one final question, I think that's from the audience. You know, when someone's making a transition from employee to boss or manager, what are some of the key mindset shifts that need to be made? So this is for somebody who's an individual contributor moving to a manager role. What sort of advice would you impart to them? I think the most important thing is to get advice from people around you because I think it can be, a, it's a big shift. The first time you move into a leadership role, sometimes you, you can feel like you're floundering because you don't really know what it means to lead. And particularly if you've been in the team and then promoted. And so now you're leading people that used to be at peer level to you. And so the most important thing is talk to them. Get a sense together as to how you want to work, what you want that team connection and engagement to actually look like. And also look around you because there will be good leaders around you. And many leaders, particularly in senior roles, you know, they know that they're where they are because they've been nurtured by someone else and they may be willing to take you on and mentor you. And that sort of those mentoring relationships can be really important in helping you understand, well, what's your leadership style? You wanna be authentically you. You can't be the carbon copy of someone else, you're still you, but what's your authentic leadership style? And how do you bring that to the table every day so that you can inspire those around you? Fabulous. You know, and, and I just want to call out a couple of articles that Michelle's written. If you snooze, do you really lose? Uh, like that. <laughs> and then five ways to ensure that leaders you manage are leading well uh, by Michelle Gibbings. And uh, finally, how to sustain team motivation in the final quarter. And you can get all of that um, from uh, not just on LinkedIn, but also um, Michelle's article at theramix.com. I think she's got six or seven that she's been publishing uh, with us. So thank you, Michelle. This has been truly enlightening. Um, I, I, I loved your insights on the toxic culture and, and how we need to somehow um, overcome some of these things. And, and again, a final call out, you know, for those who have not, you can go to michellegibbings.com and get a copy of Bad Boss um, available now. Uh, what to do if you work for one, manage one, or if you are one. <laughs> so with that, you know, Michelle, thank you so much uh, for everything. Um, we want to wish everyone a fabulous Thursday ahead. Uh, for those in Australia, I guess you've got half a day left to be productive. And for those, um, you know, starting out here in Asia, we've got a whole productive day ahead of us and another Friday before we have that weekend uh, that we're all clamoring for, right? So with that, thank you so much, um, Michelle, again, thank you so much for your insights. Really appreciate it. Um, this is a wrap for us here on the Leadernomics Show. And we've had a special guest with us, Michelle Gibbings from Melbourne, Australia, author of Bad Boss. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great, great day.